Marcus Zangbo and welcome to Dawi Kudin. Tonight I have Honorable Deputy Chairperson of National Council, Mr. Sring Dojil. Sir, thank you so much for being here with us. First question, sir. Your responsibility, your role as a Deputy Chairperson, is it just to replace the Chair when Honorable Chairperson is not around? Or do you have some other responsibilities apart from the normal responsibilities that uh, your other members would share? Yes. Uh, I think uh, as a deputy chair, you first of all, your first responsibility is like you said, uh, uh, in absence of a uh, chair, co uh, moderate the discussion in the house, um, both of the session as well as in the session, if the, uh, depending on the need. <coughs> and second is... Uh, as the ex officer uh, chair of the house committee uh, to promote and establish good relationship among help uh, uh, the uh, chair in providing leadership guiding the house and also to promote good leadership um, uh, facilitate good working relationship amongst the member as well as between the secretariat and the members of the parliament yes. how do you see your role as a deputy chairperson in some sense, I was apprising the same question to Honourable Chairperson as well, that uh, once you assume a different responsibility in a house like the National Council, you are limiting your freedom of expression as a member of parliament represent, representing a Tsongkha. And now when you assume this responsibility, and as and when Honourable Chair is not around, you're supposed to moderate, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. you're supposed to moderate the deliberations. And when you do that, you cannot express your views and opinions. So do you see that as a limitation? Yes. Uh, as a chair, if you're moderating the uh, session, then I think it's very important for you to um, moderate it without giving uh, your views. And you have to listen to the members speak. So in that way, in the session, you may not be able to express your view if you're moderating the session, yes. either as a deputy or as a chair. But then this does not mean that your issue from the constituency cannot get uh, addressed, because whatever agenda that we table there, first of all, is uh, discussed in the House. So at that time, any issues relating to your constituency, any issues that you believe should be tabled can be you know, sorted out there. In the, uh, in the form of review of the laws, in the form of review of policies, and then you give these issues to the committee, and the committee presents the, uh, the issue in the House, and before that you can also appraise the committee on what you feel about this thing. So, But uh, yes, uh, during the course of discussion, if you want to moderate neutrally, I think you just have to listen and guide the session, and if you give your uh, opinion or views to, during the session, it might... Uh, bias the discussion, but uh, nevertheless, there are ways and means to um, address uh, the situation. Yes, sir. Uh, so I said uh, uh, during the Zonka session, now, the one, now one of the reasons that uh, you have been re-elected as a member of parliament could be because of your performance for the last five years. And you have not only been re-elected, you have now been elected as the Deputy Chairperson of National Council. Keeping this in mind, do you think the expectations of people of your constituency, or for that matter, the expectations of people at large, would have grown up? Yes. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I must admit that I am a humble recipient of the love and trust of my constituency, uh, cons people from my constituency, and uh, I also enjoyed the trust of the five, uh, uh, the twenty-five. Mem uh, 24 members for unanimously electing me as the chair and uh, as the deputy chair. <clears throat> and I think um, uh, maybe I think it's to do partly with what I have, what I must have done. I don't know whether I have done anything great for the people uh, of my constituency, but whatever I have done, I have done it with dedication and uh, with uh, the keeping in mind the mandate of the house. And uh, I've try to interact with them as much as possible, try to talk to them, know their issues, and uh, somehow found ways and means to resolve the issues, if not uh, keep the issues alive in the house, if uh, it cannot be addressed at uh, the ministry or the Zonkak level. Then I brought the issue in the house with 
put it in the session and discuss uh, the issues. And I think perhaps maybe because of that, uh, people have once again given me this responsibility. And uh, I again look forward to uh, using the responsibility, the mandate of the House, uh, ways and means to uh, help uh, realize the aspiration of the people of my constituency. At the same time, I also, <clears throat> uh, the role of National Council is not only limited to uh, what you call fulfill the aspiration of the people of your constituency only, but uh, on behalf of the people of con uh, your constituency, you also have to fulfill the uh, safeguard the interest and sovereignty of the nation as a whole. So I hope I will be able to continue to live up to the trust of uh, the people. Now that you are experienced and also the expectations of people have grown taller than what it used to be before, and with the experience that you have, do you feel or do you foresee yourself, or for that matter, the house being more vibrant than it used to be? Not that it has not been vibrant or deliberated before, but can it be better now? Uh, I think expectation is also to an extent defined by what you promised during, the, during your campaign, I think. And in my case, whatever I promised, I promised as per the role and uh, the function of the National Council. And uh, definitely with experience, yes, uh, everybody becomes wiser, everybody becomes uh, um, better in performing, in delivering your role. So <clears throat> even the experience, past experience uh, of five years in lawmaking and also reviewing the issues and policies and also given the fact that we have uh, a new uh, member with fresh, uh, fresh perspective, I feel that uh, we will be, even uh, even though the press uh, National Council has set high standard, but we will be able to you know, uh, live up to the standard, if not even perform more yes. than that. Yes, Just out of uh, curiosity, sir, it would be interesting to know your assessment of the campaign trail that uh, the National Council candidates had uh, for 2013, because in 20... Uh, that will be in uh, that will be vis-a-vis -vis the campaign trail of 2008 because in 2008 all in the experience coming for the first time and even national council had promises like the national assembly members like we will be constructing roads for you we will be uh, building uh, so and so structures for you the promises that uh, developmental related uh, activities related to promises were made in 2008 but uh, didn't hear much about uh, this kind of promises in 2013. Your assessment on this? Um, I think um, <clears throat> in 2008 also, uh, perhaps, uh, maybe, I don't know, I haven't really looked at how many of the NC members, uh, contestant, made such kind of promise. But yes, definitely there were talks around that they went around promising beyond uh, their mandate without understanding their mandate. But I don't know how to ascertain the fact. However, maybe this, uh, this candidate, those candidates who uh, went around promising um, beyond their mandate may not have been elected also, so I'm not very sure about that. However, in my case, I can say for certain that before um, uh, even standing for a National Council uh, election in 2008, I looked at, I reviewed the uh, existing law, that time the Constitution, and I tried to assess uh, what is the role uh, the, the National Council is expected to be, play, and therefore, accordingly, I have promised. And uh, uh, likewise, I'm sure most of the members who got elected, even in 2008, must have done along the same lines. No, and uh, in even in 2013, you know, during this election, most have uh, understood their role very well, and they have promised as per the mandate, as per the uh, rules and function. Uh, the legitimate role and function of the National Council. But again, that does not mean that we cannot uh, play a role in uh, addressing, resolving the development activities as well, because these are, at the grassroots level, these are very important to people, yes. and there are ways and means to, you know, uh, this is not the main function of National Council, but at the same time, these are important to people. And uh, through the review function, we can take it up at, with the relevant organization. And uh, in the in the years to come, I think the uh, National Council also can, we will look into how we effectively we can address these kind of issues. Just because it's not directly related to your uh, legitimate uh, role, 
uh, that's given in the constitution it doesn't mean that you ignore this but this can also always be tackled up but however this should not be seen as the main function of the national council yes, sir. so you're going to have the first session of the second parliament in uh, sometime in first week of september so what are some of the agen agendas that you would see from the national council side yes. apart from the 11th uh, five-year plan yes. The 11th five-year plan and the budget is coming from the National Assembly because government is sitting there, so that's going to be on the agenda. But from the National Council, uh, we have been, since the day we, are, uh, we took up the responsibility, we have been um, meeting and uh, sitting for various meetings and trying to draw up agendas. And uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of uh, things. Uh, in not uh, We don't have any new legislation nor any review of any past legislation. So we have more of an issue on the follow-up activities from the last resolution, such as uh, audit report of the last, uh, um, the last session, as well as the resolutions on mining, this update implementation, follow-up implementation. And um, there might be a discussion on the soxing and some rule leasing rules and regulations as well. And also there is one issue on <clears throat> uh, Chorten vandalism and uh, yeah, secret artifact vandalism, how you should uh, we go about uh, addressing these issues. So this kind of, and also we will have a couple of uh, question hour session in which we'll be asking questions related to a uh, standard of education in Bhutan and also the growing income gaps between haves and have not because yes. as an, as a national council we also feel that these are important national issues and we must uh, keep these issues alive and hold the government accountable, make sure that government has their attention in these important areas. But uh, as discussed uh, earlier, not to be seen as an opposition. Exactly, right, yes. yes. I think it's very important. Uh, there is uh, already a, uh, in the past session also we have been accused of being uh, opposition, National Council, but it's very important for people to understand and I think with the time people uh, have understood and uh, uh, they must understand the role of opposition uh, is v uh, different and uh, the role of a national council as given in the constitution is completely different it has to be uh, we have in order for democracy to uh, be vibrant and in order to good uh, bring in good governance i think a national council must play uh, a, a <coughs> principal a political institution Yes. So, I've heard and I've overheard that uh, some of the uh, former members of parliament and some re-elected now of both the houses actually talked about their achievements and one of the achievements they talked about is having passed uh, so many laws. Now, for people like us, we wouldn't really care about the number of laws that you have passed, but uh, the fact of the matter that uh, one would really be concerned about is the kind of quality laws and applicable laws that you have passed. That, I think, is going to be more important than the number. So keeping this in mind, when you look back, do you see some amendments required even by the second, say, say, second parliament itself? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> uh, with regard to the quantity and the quality, yes, uh, Quality is very important, but at the same time, even uh, quantity to an extent is important because uh, if you look at uh, the past laws that have been passed, and when in terms of number, it looks quite uh, sizable for a uh, member of parliament in the uh, first tenure to be passing so much law. But then these are required for we are transiting into a democracy and these uh, we need laws to guide the functioning of the institution that are newly established so therefore it was required and also at the same time uh, these laws have been already in draft form and it has been deliberated uh, at the consultation level in the min respective ministries so therefore that's why um, uh, one of the criticism is that so many laws have been passed but it is they, it doesn't have uh, 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 what you call relevance indeed amendment so there are a lot of criticism like that, but then this had to be passed because it was required in order for the demo to strengthen the institution under democratic setup. 
Well, henceforth, I think <clears throat> maybe we will have to go slow on it. Um, we will have to carefully review it. But if there is a need, then yes, uh, we have to find time to review them thoroughly and it must go on. Just because uh, um, we are passing too many, because they, we are facing this criticism that we are passing too many uh, laws, we cannot afford to shelve it. It depends on the need and the urgency of the bill. And we must find ways and means to deliberate it thoroughly. And uh, also we must uh, find ways to incorporate people's view. But uh, at the same time, I think it's also not true that these laws, when they have been drafted, they are not consulted, being consulted with people. If you look at uh, the laws that has been passed in the past session, uh, they have been consul uh, consulted at various levels in their own capacity. It, the, it's not that a member of parliament one day gets up and thinks of, uh, think of proposing a law. Yes. The law, the whatever law we have been passed so far, has come as a government bill, which means government have been working on it, uh, the respective department or agency, uh, the higher consultant, and then they also do consultation meeting with the uh, with the relevant stakeholder, and then it goes through the cabinet, and then it comes down to um, the parliament. And even in the parliament, what we do is we do not uh, just uh, we, uh, blindly pass it. We uh, discuss it uh, in the committee. It's given to uh, one of the committee. If it is introduced in the National Council, then a uh, thorough discussion takes place there. Then we go to the constituency. We share this uh, draft with people um, in our campaign, uh, uh, not campaign, but in our constituency visit, we seek the uh, opinion and then we try to incorporate it. And then again, this go on, uh, goes to the next house, deliberated there. So with time, sometimes, um, you know, in, even in the process of implementation, there is problem. So therefore, uh, maybe if there is anything that any loss that need to be reviewed is not because there is uh, not much consultation yes i agree that we need to put more effort in consultation but uh, sometimes there is problem in implementation in understanding uh, between the the intent of the law as well as the uh, way in which it's been implemented now, uh, you talked about consultation and uh, you also talked about uh, the need for amendment and review now, maybe so one case in point would be the Tobacco Control Act and so many views being shared through all kinds of medium. Uh, social media is one active uh, forum where people share all kinds of views mm. on issues like this. Don't you see a need for amendment then? Well, <clears throat> the Tobacco Control Act has been the most controversial uh, law that, has, uh, that the last parliament has passed. And... Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, and I've always been saying that there's nothing wrong with that, uh, particularly with regard to this, uh, the the personal consumption. I think the whole uh, issue and hue and cry about tobacco is that the sentence for personal consumption has been too high. But if you look at the first draft, the the first uh, law that has been passed, tobacco control, um, the penalty part. The whole intent of the tobacco uh, control bill was not to penalize the personal consumption, not to penalize those who are addicted, who cannot live without tobacco, but it is to control the ma sale of the tobacco, control the sale of the tobacco and the, the availability of tobacco in the market, and therefore it might help to reduce those who are smoking, and also it might discourage people when they don't see it available freely in the market. It might also uh, help to... You know, uh, people in, um, in uh, not smoking. So that was the whole intent. But however, uh, you know, it has been, this is one of the bills that has been most talked about, most politicized. However, <clears throat> I've been submitting my view in the, uh, in the se sessions that nothing is wrong with the Tobacco Act, but uh, the problem present, uh, that, that problem could be solved by looking at the rules. The rules was too strict rules became too stringent. Um, in the Act, what it says is there, uh, the personal consumption is allowed and the permissible limit will be determined by the board. The board uh, has the authority to fix the, uh, the, to fix the quantity, the per permissible quantity. And in that case, what happened was the quantity, permissible quantity was fixed a bit low. Yes. And therefore, any person who bought uh, 
smoking tobacco and tobacco product within that limit, a uh, little bit beyond that limit, were uh, given heavy penalty. But that was not the intention of the law. That is because the rules define it that way. And therefore, we could have done by correcting the rules. But however, um, this was not seen in that line. And uh, then in the process, m most people landed up in jail. And then there's a lot of hue and cry. And then we couldn't see the things properly. There were a lot of uh, public opinion going on. And even for that matter, the interpretation in the judiciary also they did in, uh, you know, in the way uh, that they thought was uh, the right. But the intent of the tobacco was not to penalize the personal consumption, but to control the sale. And it was very broad in my view. There is also the provision about uh, education, uh, creating awareness about the ill effect of the tobacco. But however, uh, I think the media kept on highlighting yes. on only on. Uh, on the penalty part and uh, so in the process there are a lot of vested interests so therefore it's very difficult to yes. you know see for people to see that's why i was telling you in the jonkas session i think it's you have to look thing look at things objectively that's very important if not yes. you could be you know so, misled but now the understanding the whole point and sometimes misunderstanding certain points do you still see that there's no need for amendment because without amendment people would feel that uh, the blame game will continue? Um, it has been amended also. Following that, uh, following the the public outcry, following the, you know, uh, th those allegations, it has been proposed for amendment. And then in the, uh, the legislative rules, the law cannot be amended uh, after it's been passed for one year. So therefore, uh, we have waited for one year and then it was stable for uh, re-discussion, re-deliberation, and that time, the council uh, view was: you know, if you think that it, the problem with the tobacco is the implementation, if you think that you cannot implement, then let's do away with the ban. That was the suggestion. We took that completely. You know, let's not even um, <clears throat> make such kind of uh, penal, uh, impose such kind of penalty. Let's do away with the ban. Let people smoke. Uh, then uh, the government said no. Then we also proposed that this can be amended by looking at the. Uh, what you call the rules, but however there are other provisions which were not problematic that yes. time, but which could be prob uh, problematic in future. So we amended that also, and now it is it stands in the amended form, and the, even the quantity has been raised. It actually should be in the rule. It's more convenient to be in the rule because you know, depending on the situation, you can bring it up and down. However, now it is in the. So as far as I feel, it is in a good uh, form. But, uh, however, if there is a greater public opinion, if people feel there is a problem with the tobacco, uh, in, in, even in its present form, then uh, they must let it know through their respective member of parliament. And it can be, the issue can be tabled, and we'll see the need, whether there is really need to do it or not. Sir, talking about consultative process, what kind of methods would you use to consult or come up, initiate this consultative process? Because it is literally impossible to talk to every individual about certain decisions. But then the expectations, as tall as it could stand, is that uh, you would want people to be consulted. And this is one issue that people raised so much in different forums that they have never been consulted. How should they be consulted? Where should they be consulted? And why should they be consulted? It's a democratic process, but then you have elected your representative, and then after that, again, you need every individual to be involved in any kind of discussion and to be consulted. Is it a possibility? How do you do it? Well, uh, consultation is a must, and I think we should find ways and means to do it. And uh, even in the past, like I said before, it's not that we didn't have any consultation with the people. Maybe the degree of the consultation needs to be more. And consultation, we cannot uh, do away with it. And uh, like you said, yes, uh, for every decision, I think it will be very difficult for the government to be consulting people. It's good if they can consult with people and if they take the feedback. Yes. Uh, whereas uh, in, the, in the case of parliament, what we do is we used to go to the constituency after every session. We <clears throat> present them. Uh, what has been discussed in the past, and then we also get the f feedback on the laws that are in that will be in this deliberation in the forthcoming session. So uh, maybe we'll need to find, uh, um, even though it's quite difficult, 
but uh, I think we must uh, because democracy once uh, saying that you have given the power to the people you cannot just leave it to the elected people alone so we must con this is also another responsibility you must uh, uh, give feedback you must uh, yes. uh, keep on updating what's happening there otherwise uh, you could be misled also so it's as much as it is difficult to um, find ways and means to consult to uh, you find it practically impossible to take all uh, to do consultation on every aspect but i think it's important that we create this condition create the ways and means to listen to the people and then <clears throat> after all if we make decision based on um, the majority consensus not only among the parliamentarians but also uh, public view if there is enough room even if a channel for them to voice out their uh, views and also to incorporate their views but not all the views uh, reasonable views so then I think we can come up with good legislation, good policies. Yes. So are people actively, are constituents actively participating or coming forward to discussions or deliberations while you visit your constituencies? Or are they actively engaging themselves in sharing feedbacks? Because when we had this recent uh, National Assembly debates, mm -hmm. one of the constituents in the East actually asked a candidate that uh, we have never seen you visit our constituency. And the answer that uh, candidate gave was, I came twice, but I have never seen you around. So are there any engagement or involvement from the constituents when you visit them? Uh, well, in my case, uh, there are quite a number of people who come and visit, uh, I mean, who come and attend uh, my constituency visit, and they actively voice out uh, their concern. And uh, I'll make sure that it is heard, it is addressed. But like you said, there are also people who never come to the uh, meetings, but at the end uh, they have something to say from me behind. And this is something we cannot rule out. I think it is there everywhere in every con community. However, uh, we have to make an effort to, you know, <clears throat> even bring those people in line and also to hear their voice, uh, to listen to their views. Uh, maybe it has not been achieved in the past five years, but from here, henceforth, I think they must have been embarrassed by asking that question also. Yes. So therefore, I think it's also a responsibility on their part to make sure that they attend those um, meetings, take those meetings seriously. And I always tell them whenever I go in my past uh, five years, I've been always telling them now it's a democracy. Um, <clears throat> every decision that is uh, taking place will take place through consultation so therefore it's important for you to attend the meeting know what the, what the government plans are not only our uh, parliamentary visit but uh, meetings but also any meetings that is conducted by different sectors you have to listen to their policies their plans to give their feedback and if you don't do that at the end when it comes as a policy then yes. you uh, you will be found in a very uncomfortable position then it will be quite late to change uh, such policies so I've been always educating people on, on that line. So, final question. One misconception or assumption that uh, some people have is that the role of National Council, or for that matter, any members of Parliament, they visit the constituencies, you visit the constituencies twice a year, come back, attend the sessions, and between these uh, uh, two activities, there seem to be not so much of happening or there seem to be not much of work for the members other than Facebooking, sharing your views on Facebook and maybe start a blog and then operate that blog, give your articles, what you're up to. Apart from that, people think that you may not uh, seem to have so much work then. What do you do in between? Uh, as a member of parliament, as an elected uh, official, it's very important for you to stay in touch with people and uh, it can be done in the various forms, you know, like Facebooking, blogging and all. It's also one of the ways in which uh, you keep in touch with your people. For example, in my case, I have a blog. Whenever there's an issue, I post it up. And also in my Facebook, I have group, uh, half group, half Toru group, and I give my feed, uh, whatever decision we have taken and get try to get their feedback. Usually they give good feedback. Usually they don't comment on it, but I know that they're reading it. So, so Facebooking and tweet, uh, tweet. Uh, I'm not in tweet, on Twitter, but uh, blogging. These are one of the ways and means to in, keep in touch with them also. And Parliament, um, 
also function uh, we function through com- uh, committees we have different committees when you're not in the session uh, it doesn't mean that we don't uh, our work also happens behind the camera in fact most of the work takes place behind camera whatever agenda is to be put up in the session in the live session we discuss it beforehand in the uh, committees and so committees uh, keep you busy throughout doesn't mean that uh, sometimes you it entails you to travel more than two times in yes. your constituency so we, our hands are full but again doesn't mean that we uh, we cannot have uh, there's no room for improvement we need to improve the there is a lot of room for improvement yes. and uh, yes uh, our role is not only limited to what you see on the live cameras. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you. Well, with this, we come to the end of uh, our interview. That was Honorable Deputy Chairperson of National Council, Mr. Sring Thank you so much for watching the opening. Good night and Tashidili.